Hello everybody, welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian. Today we are going to be breaking down a top 16 from a series of tournaments that we've covered in this channel before. And these are the Salt City tournaments. So for those who don't know, Salt City is a group out in Utah. For those who don't know, this will be the third Salt City tournament that they've had down in Utah. And these are some pretty exciting tournaments. They're, they're starting to develop a pretty big scene out there. This one had 90 plus players at this one. So figured we'd cover this 3K event and uh, tell you about all the decks that did well. Remember, if you like videos like this, make sure to hit that like button, that subscribe button. And if you're feeling super generous, check out patreon.com slash comedian MTG, where you can help keep the lights on we are doing some restructuring over at patreon which should be basically rolled out by the time march comes along but uh it's been some crazy couple weeks so that hasn't happened quite yet but we are looking to go over some of these tiers go and update them to the year 2024 and get all the things comedian mtg patreon up and ready to go without any further ado let's break down this tournament with some pretty spicy decks We are starting things off with Sisse Schoolhouse Rocks by Behemoth Dan. We have a pretty classic Sisse Planeswalker deck. This is the classic five color Sisse deck we have grown to know and love, basically doing the normal Sisse stuff. So the idea is to assemble a combination of Sisse and some legendary permanents with the ability to have a Fabro Elder or a Savala or a bloom tender or a dock side that make five mana when they either enter or tap and from there you're able to chain up a number of different permanents until you get Aminatu, Nicol Bolas, and Oath of Teferi out of your deck eventually able to have infinite planeswalker activations and go from there. This deck's been doing quite well in our format as of late and will probably continue to be doing so. There's a lot of evolutions with this archetype that we are seeing over time. This list, very lean, low to the ground version of this archetype, so I'm very interested in seeing how this list is going to be able to be doing. Uh, we're seeing some of the One Ring Invitation, which is like some of these lists in Sisse are running and some of them are not just because of the fact that it's kind of hard to get a bunch of colorless mana in the deck, but we're seeing a lot of the normal Sisse stuff, a few pieces once again, like the One Ring, which are hit or miss in some Sisse lists. We have Olivia, which is very popular in certain Sisse palettes, very unpopular with others. So apart from that though, this is a pretty standard Sisse list, able to make the top 16. Congrats to Behemoth Dan. We have two Ristic CEDH Zur Tempo by Fizzle. We have Zur here. A list that, uh, you know, since the printing of Born Upon the Wind, people have been talking about this deck as if it is sort of back from obscurity, which it felt like it was in for a considerable amount of time. Now we are in a grindy mid-range format, so it makes sense that being able to pull a Ristic Study, which everyone is claiming is dominating the format out of your deck, uh, is pretty dang good. And the fact that that can then become a second Ristic Study with an Estra's Invocation usually means that you're in a pretty solid spot. Worst case scenario, you'd then get a third <laughs> Effect with the Mystic Remora, so I definitely can see how Zur would be able to grind if you kind of let it do its thing. Now, one of the big benefits of Zur is that sometimes if your opponents are, you know, so relaxed on you going to the mid-range plan, you can just go grab a Necropotence and pump 20 to 30 life into it and try and use that Born Upon the Wind that we talked about earlier to try and win the game. Not a ton of other ways to flash in stuff at instant speed with this deck, so it looks like Born is like the main instant speed line. I know, depending on the Zur interpretation, some have higher card quality, some have more flash stuff. It really depends on what they're doing with this deck, but interesting to see Zur make a top 16 of a tournament after sort of not really being around for quite some time. I am the Dice Beast by Devious Pulsar. Ty am sort of been out of commission since Orcish Bowmasters started picking up popularity in the format, but here we have a Ty am list making this top 16. This is a lot of the normal Ty am stuff. If you are confused about Ty am on a base level, we did a deck tech on Ty am here on this channel, which, you know, you, not all of the slots are going to be the same, but it can at least give you the general idea of what to expect when you look at a deck like Ty am. It's a complicated CEDH deck. It's very, very difficult. And, you know, I, as someone who am very comfortable in this format, still find myself looking at pieces in this deck sometimes and going, what are they doing here, right? So it is the central conceit of the deck is to create situations where you're able to activate tie him an infinite amount of times and mill through your entire library, therefore creating states where you can pull all of your permanents onto the battlefield and win from there. Luckily, the printing of Orchestra Masters did actually help clean up some of the tie lines. You don't have to play some of the weird cards that were previously available in tie but 
Orcish Bowmasters being able to be cast over and over again definitely helps to make things a little bit cleaner for sure as a as a final outlet. <laughs> we have Manboy Libs here with I can't believe it's not Blue Farm. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> what we have here is a pretty classic Dawn Waker Thrasios list. This list is definitely a lot more focused on what it feels like Dawn Waker Thrasios looked like a few months ago with you know, pieces like the one ring being added. And I feel like this is actually very close to what I brought to the cookout um, with Baron, Master Wizard and Dockside lines being in the deck and definitely still running a lot of these early mana dorks. Whereas the most recent version of this list, one that is not currently on the database, is uh, a little bit faster, way more into the talismans, has things like Consecrated Sphinx and Holdbreaker Horse. So definitely a lot more top end to that version of the deck. This is um, the sort of uh, snapshot of the version of this deck that was only playing Grim Model and stuff like that. So <clears throat> despite this being a relatively recent tournament, some of the tech is a little bit more towards the old version of this deck. But at the same time, Don Market Thrasios has been a deck that has been doing well for quite some time. I'm uh, kind of surprised to see it do well in the face of some Bowmasters that we definitely see up here at these top tables. So well done to our pilot for making top 16 with this deck. We have Critical Five by Kane Energy. Kane Energy? I don't know how you would say that. Uh, <laughs> but it's a Magda list. We have this Magda CEDH deck and Magda has actually had an insane month in the month of January where five of the 11 players who have played them in 64 plus player tournaments have made the top 16, which is like an insane conversion rate for a deck, especially a deck full of things that died to Orcish Bowmasters, which, you know, you're starting to hear a common theme of being surprised that Bowmasters is not blowing out certain decks a lot more. For those who don't know, the point is to get Magda and get five treasures so that you can activate her ability. A lot of the classic lines involve things like having an artifact dwarf and using our classic win condition, Clock of Omens. So Clock of Omens plus an artifact dwarf plus Magda equals infinite treasures and infinite activations of Magda. From there, there are so, 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 so many ways to win the game. Uh, after that point, things get a little bit more complicated. There's a bunch of dwarves here to help trigger Magda because when your door is tapped, all, they also make treasure tokens. You have things with Dockside. Sometimes there are Dockside lines, which we do have here with Cloudstone Curio that do not actually use Magda until you're using it as an outlet, which I really appreciate in the deck because uh, when I picked up Magda about a year ago, I thought it was kind of odd that they weren't on these Cloudstone lines, but it seems like a lot more Magda pilots are actually going back to playing those lines again, which I, I think is a very, very smart move for the deck. I feel like having that sort of line that does not require your commander until the very end is just most often going to set you up for success not to mention all the things that you can get in this deck that mean like if magda is locked out with a drain if you can probably use those things as an outlet as well things like literally bogard and hellkite right like <laughs> if you don't need uh your commander you can just be bouncing them up and down or obviously if you can play bogard and hellkite and just kill the creature too but you know there's, there are several outlets in the deck that allow you to convert infinite mana to winning the game even if you do not have your commander out one of the biggest upgrades for this deck was definitely portal to phyrexia when that card came out this deck definitely got some more legs able to control a lot of the grindier matchups a lot better apart from that we're seeing the pretty classic magda stuff uh magda can be built in many many different ways in the sense that it feels like there's about, you know, 50 core cards to the deck, but then there's a lot of flex slots that can come up in different situations. And, you know, a lot of these confident Magda pilots can keep forming quite well. Congrats to our top 16 player here. We have Broccoli. <laughs> I think it's like broccoli, but spelled weird. Uh, by Peanut Hero. We have a Rocco Cabaretti food chain deck. A very classic Rocco interpretation. Um, you obviously have your food chain squee lines with your commander. Uh, squeeze right there. There we go. And then you have the ability to use like Kiki Jiki plus Karma Guidelines. I'm interested to see Revelark in this deck. I'm wondering if there's any sort of uh, peculiarities with that card in here as well. Also, the fact that there's like a Minskin Boo as a sack outlet, I'm guessing, is rather interesting to me. I know we have Arena Rector here, which is a very, very solid uh, way to win with Rocco. Basically, if you have a sack outlet, much like Minskin Boo, which I feel like once again, there's just like better versions of sack outlets in these colors, like uh, that don't require sorcery speed activations. But uh, what you're able to do is go get Vivian on the hunt. And then because Rocco is a three drop, you're able to go up a pod line that involves you getting Felidar Guardian, then getting Karma Guide to give back Felidar Guardian. And then you go and grab Kiki Jiki with Felidar are on the battlefield and you go and win the game. So nice clean pod line able to win the game pretty cohesively, pretty easily as soon as you get Vivian plus any three drop, but luckily you have a three drop in the command zone. Then 
These decks are also known for playing their Dockside Emil lines and their Dockside Sabretooth. Sometimes they don't play Emil specifically because if Rocco is already on the field, you can't actually use infinite treasures as an outlet with Emil because you're able to just flicker Rocco, which it's only going to be X equals zero, right? So that's why Sabretooth is still, like technically better in this deck than it is in other uh, you know, infinite mana decks in these colors. So it's kind of interesting, but I still think Emil Dockside is, is so good that you just really have trouble not playing it, right? And obviously if Rocco's in your command zone, then you just win the game pretty easily um so that's pretty cool apart from that we are making a ton of mana we're playing a very few amount of disruptive pieces things like deafening sounds stuff like that and then we are just converting our creature tutors right into a win con and honestly once again with the vivian lines in this deck it's pretty easy to do so so congrats to our top 16 player we have baron light eyes and kana here with cedh belby she does what uh, I'm so excited to see this. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, Belby was a primer that I had on the, I think not on the database itself, but on the Brewer's Corner back when that was a thing on the database, or I think it might still be. I don't know. I haven't looked at the database, database in quite some time. But yeah, Belby was a list I championed for some time. I had a whole primer written about it. It was really, really fun to play, and I'm so excited to see it seeing play. For those who don't know, the idea with Belby is that you get an enabler like a Shadow Spear, like a Conquistador, Thornbow Archer, Pulse Tracker, Night Market Lookout, and they say whenever you attack with these creatures, uh, it deals one damage to each opponent. And what Belby says is at the beginning of each player's post-combat main phase, that player adds two colorless mana for each of your opponents who lost life this turn. So the idea is you go to combat, you sort of use these one mana enablers to go like turn one enabler, turn two, play Belby, second main phase, you have six colorless mana, right? So it's a, an extreme amount of ramp that you get right out of this command zone. And that's sort of the concept of this deck. Now, historically, there's been a bunch different ways to play the deck whether some people play it more proactively like we see here with things like pier in the abyss and tooth and nail and stuff like that and like broodlord whereas other times the list has been a little bit heavier into things like stacks effects like throne of the god pharaoh and so oh a god pharaoh statue pardon me just like this one has here but as we can see like a lot more proactive lines in this variant right we have necropotence we have bulls of citadel we've got a bunch of stuff like that the one ring was a huge pickup for this deck and for sure super excited to see that um, actually did have someone reach out to me pretty recently being like, hey, Belby got some new tools. You should come back and try playing it again. So it's kind of cool to see it making the top 16. I mean, one of the reasons that uh, this deck did not make the actual CEDH decklist database was people said that they thought I was the only one who could pilot this deck well. So the fact that we do have a top 16 performance from this deck is pretty sick. I, I love seeing people out there repping Belby and uh, making this very quirky, unique deck uh, C play and CEDH. I genuinely miss this archetype quite a lot and uh, honestly might want to give it a, a spin sometime soon. I don't know if I'd play this exact 99 like this, but I, I love the idea of getting to play one of my favorite decks again. We have Commanding Performance by Big Anonymous and Pyrosmog. This is Unctus, the Grand Metatect. Uh, I have only ever seen like Useless Knowledge play this deck before, so it's really cool to see this top 16, a C EDH tournament. For those who don't know, Unctis says other blue creatures you control have whenever this creature becomes tapped to draw a card and discard a card. Other artifact creatures you control get plus one plus one and for a Phyrexian mana until the end of turn target creature you control becomes a blue artifact in addition to its other colors and types activating as a sorcery. So the general idea with Unctis is that you want to set up a situation in which you are looting through your entire deck vis-a-vis -vis draw a discard, right? So with example of a card like Afeto Alchemist, which says you can untap a target artifact or creature, does not say another target artifact or creature, so you can tap a Fetto to target itself, and so you'll create a loop where you just tap a Fetto, which will untap it, which you tap a Fetto, which will untap it, right? And you'll be able to do that infinite amounts of times. <clears throat> you can do that with a number of different combos in this deck as well. There's things where you can have cards like Kelpie Guy, which untap another permanent, and then uh, Iareth of the Healing House, which untaps another permanent, and then you have them both, and they can, hey, guess what? untap each other uh, by tapping those abilities, right? So you can create a bunch of different loops in which you are untapping a bunch of different creatures and just looting through your entire deck. One of the reasons you see a thing like Containment Construct here, which is whenever you discard a card, you may exile it from your graveyard. If you do, you may play that card this turn, right? So you're looting through your entire deck. It's not like you're actually drawing cards, right? You are drawing and then discarding. So you're not gaining card advantage. So a card like Containment Construct actually helps you start to, you know, gain advantage by looting through your entire deck. And you have a number of these effects here that 
that all do that untap another target permanent style thing. You have cards like Urza here to be able to be outlets and, and also to have a, a significant amount of tapping things right now. If you're tapping artifact creatures, they're triggering Unctress and doing a bunch of crazy stuff like that as well. You have Trocrum Retriever, classic Emery staple, which Emery is also in this list. So you're able to cast things over and over again, uh, which I think you can. Yeah, you can definitely Emery through your entire uh, deck by like making infinite mana and and as you're going through once again you're you're filtering with your unctus this is a is a quirky little deck here for sure and anytime yeah once again like all these freed from the real stuff too right like <clears throat> even if you're using a card like silver mirror right you're tapping for a blue and then using the freed from the real to untap the silver mirror uh, that is a tap and untap, which is going to give you that unctus loot as well. So definitely a quirky, quirky deck here. It doing a lot of interesting stuff with just tapping and untapping. There's a bunch of different combos, things like Retraction Helix, which I haven't seen since, you know, standard 2015. <laughs> so there's a lot of weird stuff. Uh, Agatha Soul Cauldron definitely finds a very good spot in this deck. Thousand Year Elixir is really cool to be able to like make your guys tap pretty easily. Clown Car, it's a free crewer, lets you tap your stuff pretty easily. So this is a super interesting deck. Um, we have Born of a Thousand Memes V2.2 by Boss Fiend. This is an Evelyn the Covetous deck. For those who don't know, Evelyn is a classic Grixis commander with a few fun twists. The main one being you see all these animation effects be able to reanimate stuff out of the graveyard, specifically for, for World Gorger Dragon. Evelyn, when it came out, became the official best World Gorger outlet out there right now. Now I've enjoyed actually playing Evelyn and I brought in her to a tournament before and I think the most recent version of her and the one that I was doing the most work on I did end up cutting a lot of the World Gorger Dragon stuff, despite me really, you know, enjoying World Gorger Dragon as a card, as an archetype. I feel like you can actually play this list a little bit cleaner without a lot of these cards that really don't do anything else for the rest of your strategy, right? Like you're you're able to set up these World Gorger loops and that's great. Evelyn can exile through a bunch of your deck. You can play Bowmasters and then kill your opponents that way, right? But <clears throat> apart from that, it's, it's quite underwhelming. One of the coolest combos in the deck is dual caster mage plus not the normal twin flame stuff but actually ghostly flicker because what you can do is you can ghostly flicker uh target a land and target dual caster mage you then have it resolve have a new dual caster mage come in targeting the ghostly flicker etc etc and then as you're making multiple copies of ghostly flicker you can then flash in your commander between iterations of the ghostly flicker and have it so that you are then exiling through your deck with your so Ghostly Flicker is able to win at instant speed with Evelyn and a dual caster mage, which is pretty cool. There's also Twin Flame for the classic dual caster mage lines in case you want to go more in that direction. And luckily, all these flicker effects and things like Twin Flame and stuff like that work actually really well with Evelyn because they allow you to get more card advantage from her enter the battlefield ability. This is also a Nas deck playing some aggressive breach lines like things with Grinding Station, all that stuff. Uh, for those playing the deck, don't think Defense Grid does protect your World Gorger line because it will go away at some point, which is not great for you. <laughs> Apart from that, this looks like a pretty normal Grixis list, just with a little bit of Dragon Spice in the deck and some nice efficient interaction. And also, obviously, we talked about the dual caster lines as well. So Grixis with a bit of a twist here in this Evelyn list. Congrats to our pilot. We have Ox Farm by Big Blue Ox. Okay, that sort of makes sense here. Uh, this is a very large version of Blue Farm, where instead of the ever so classic ad nauseum that you would see in Blue Farm, we are seeing a top end thread of Consecrated Sphinx here with this deck. Very similar to the list I brought to the Crimson Lion tournament where I won the Time Twister in the sense that it is running the Displacer Kitten Lions and a couple of other pieces here, but has unique cards like Boromir, which I know has been picked up in certain versions of this deck, and once again, Consecrated Sphinx as a top end instead of Adnaz, which I do love the idea of. I don't know if I would go as bold as to put it in my own version of this uh, archetype, but I do think Consecrated Sphinx being super hard to interact with and definitely being a card that will win the game uh, within a certain amount of time, definitely will you know do the mission it sets out to achieve. Shouldred also in this version, it's definitely a grindier version of Blue Farm, so it does make sense that a grindy card like Shieldred would be in here. We have Talion for card advantage, One Ring for card advantage. We have Conqueror's Flail, which I feel like we don't see a ton in Blue Farm, but it makes sense in a deck like this where you can place it early and then equip later. It's obviously very scary uh, and less effective than something like Grand Olisher, but Flail does get the job done at certain points. No Born Upon the Wind in this version of Blue Farm, which I mentioned in my last Top 16 breakdown, has definitely been more and more popular as time goes on. Apart from that, 
the the spice starts to run out at a certain point as you have the normal underworld breach lines we have the classic thoracal consult lines here in this deck and at the end of the day blue farm with a different top end of con sphinx over ad nauseum congrats to our pilot for this interesting take on blue farm we have death and discard by joe bass we have Armix and Jeska, which is a super interesting commander combination here. And boy, oh boy, this deck is a roller coaster. <laughs> I love this thing. It's all over the place. This is basically like grindy artifact control uh, in Rakdos. I'm kind of fascinated because I feel like this deck straight up concedes to the first dock side that's played against it. <laughs> um, oh, except for there is a Torpor Orb here in this deck that is also on dock side as an ETB. But I guess that's, uh, you have Goblin Engineer too. So you do lose a couple of your pieces here with your own Torpor Orb. Okay, that's pretty fascinating. This is a very grindy Rakdos deck. I feel like most uh, things nowadays with Rakdos are very much the classic, hey, I am here to go fast, right? We were talking about things like Rograk and Tavesh, and we are talking about Jeska and Tavesh as well, right? Like a lot of these very proactive Rakdos decks that exist nowadays, but this one, definitely trying to go for that grind plan. We have Zerzoth to like shake up hands. You have Anya's Ravager here, it's like crazy discard card advantage. You have Braids as a control piece or a draw engine. You have Sire of Insanity, the ever classic loony card. Uh, we have Andrew here, the Traveler, which is very, very good at reanimating artifacts. And hey, guess what? We're on 28 of them. You have both the Citadel lines that pay off by Aetherflux Reservoir and Sensei's top, right? Drawing through your entire deck, each life, and then being able to fishbowl people with Reservoir. You have some interesting pieces like Tanglewire here to slow the game down a little bit. File of Gladrill is definitely not a card I expected a lot of, but I guess it makes sense if your entire point of your deck is you're going to be chucking pieces out of your hand pretty consistently. And then we have Chimil, the Inner Sun. One that I adore this card, but I hadn't seen it see play yet from this point. So very cool to see it in this list here. This list is definitely super unique. Uh, basically, at the end of the day, this is like Rakdos discard dot deck plus the extra efficiency of definitely being a very good pull our you know stuff out of our graveyard style deck right it's very much in tombs for artifacts and the pieces like Enri here and stuff like that can get them out which is kind of cool you have your goblin welders as well to be able to pick up the pieces that you're throwing in the yard like chenil and bulls citadel and stuff like that so super weird deck in in the best way in the most loving way i, I really enjoy how quirky this list is and not like any other deck i've seen in cdh which makes me very very happy i think like anytime there's some cool quirky innovation like this that cdh just becomes a little bit better and more open well done to joe bass for a really cool deck we have father stretch my hands part one which sounds nasty uh by bfh joker 42 this is anala anala is a deck that has been around in our format for quite some time and i literally never hear about <laughs> anala seems to like do well in a lot of these tournaments in like the early parts and then fade out as they get close to the top 16 but here we have an anala list that clearly ended the swiss with the highest ranking of those that didn't make the top four here in fifth place so anala for those who don't know you're trying to win the game with a line with spellseeker spellseeker plus one black mana floating becomes a one card combo when you play it in Anala and because you have this eminence ability you don't even need to play your commander. So Spellseeker makes for very very quick wins in the deck. You also have Ruthless Technomancer and Bloodline Necromancer which are able to loop and create uh, infinite attackers under rule of laws which is actually pretty sweet. In this version of the deck you see Scholar of Ages instead of Archaeomancer which I've talked to so many Anala pilots. So many Anala pilots have so many strong opinions about which one of those lines is the more relevant one for the CEDH meta and uh, yeah you, Anala pilots can talk your ear off about Archaeomancer versus Scholar of the Ages and many people will be convinced that they are right for their version but Cool to see Anala do well in this tournament. It is a deck that does not really do well nowadays. So seeing it have that extra bit of kick is pretty sweet. And Born Upon the Wind, I can imagine it's probably pretty helpful with those necro lines in the deck. Intuition also makes for some interesting spellseeker stuff. So well done to our pilot for making the top 16 with this deck and being the highest ranked of our top 16 players that did not make the top four. Do you want to take your CEDH skills to the next level? Well, I want to remind you that here in Comedian MTG, I do coaching as my full-time job. So if you're interested in receiving coaching from one of the top ranked players in the world and you want to take your skills to the next level, 
feel free to reach out to me at comedianmtg at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at comedianmtg or comedian underscore mtg over on Discord, all of which will be in the description down below this video. Find out more about how you can take your CEDH skills to the next level. Uh, we have a very long reference to the Cranberries here by Battleborn 6. Uh, when the thoughts cause silence in your head and your head they're fighting. Anyways, uh, this is a blue farm list here and this blue farm list is playing ad nauseum and not consecrated sphinx. <laughs> That's uh, very, very normal. <laughs> we have a 27 land blue farm list, which is on the lower end of blue farm. We have a very lean curve here, topping out in these two, three drops. No four drops like Talion. No, well, we do have a one ring here in the slot. Um, they're on the Necropotence and Born Upon a Win lines that we are starting to see become much more popular in these blue farm decks, much like we were seeing in the ones from the boil. So definitely a bit of a speed upgrade from these blue farm archetypes. And yeah, apart from that, this is a pretty traditional blue farm list, one that we know pretty well as this deck and this archetype continue to do well in our format and uh, define these top tables so congrats to battleborn six on our top four here <laughs> following up that great transition we have blue farm is for weenies by tcv pride this is tivit we have a pretty classic tivit list here um quite similar to the list i took to scg or the mox masters invitational actually it's almost identical to the list I took to the Mox Masters Invitational, question mark? I don't know. But yeah, this is a very classic Tivit list. Uh, we were talking about Tivit being able to break parity on a number of different stacks pieces like Cursed Totem and Graph Digger Sage, Tivit being the definitive like Esper control deck of the format. Oh yeah, I guess I wasn't on Dauntless Smithler because that did not exist when I took that to the Invitational. But um, yeah, this is pretty solid Esper control with Tivit. Tivit is a very controlling deck. It is one of the big top end mid range decks of our format with Tivit being such a huge engine. And unlike other Esper lists, you do have access to our one card combo in Time Sieve here, which works perfectly with your commander as long as there are four players at the table. And yeah, Tivit is doing pretty well lately. It's, it's definitely taken a bit of a dip from where it used to be, but we are still seeing it show up and make top results like this one. So congrats to our pilot here. We have Evelyn Covet Combos by Zectboo. Zectboo is a name I know for a fact I've said before because it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> we have a different Evelyn in the Covetous list here with some different inclusions. We have no dual caster lines in this version of the deck. We have Ad Nauseum in this version of the deck, which I think was in the last one as well. But we have Hullbreaker Horror as another reanimation target in this version of the deck and Displacer Kitten, which is one of my favorite things to do with Evelyn because you get four new cards every time you go through loop and it also resets your Evelyn's restriction of only being able to do one of these cards per turn. Yeah, this list is a definitely a grindier version of this Evelyn list. It's pretty cool though. Not really ready to see three wheels in this deck because it does feel a little bit more controlling than some other Grixis lists, but we have Notion Thief and Bowmasters as sort of that anti-wheel tech that allows you to take advantage of those wheels and use them asymmetrically. We also have a bunch of card advantage engines, things like the One Ring, stuff like that, Ristic Mystic, all those. We have Underworld Breach. This one is still on World Gorger Dragon, however, uh, which seems to have picked up these Evelyn World Gorger lists um, from the last time we covered these tournaments because I don't remember any Evelyns really showing up, but now we have two here with these World Gorger loops showing up and making the top tables of this tournament here. Congrats to our Evelyn pilot for a very interesting deck and uh, cool to see Evelyn back on top. I worked on Evelyn a good amount I want to say like four or five months ago uh, and ended up working on other lists. I think I ended up switching over to Tevesh Krom right as I was working on Evelyn. But a lot of the tech that I see now in Tevesh Krom uh, came from me actually spending a lot of time working on Evelyn, which is pretty interesting. They're very similar in play style, except for Evelyn does kind of get that like Nimrus flash style stuff, which can be pretty cute at the right circumstances, but it definitely does not draw Krom, <laughs> does not draw cards like Krom and Tavesh do for sure. We have Offensive Wombat here with, uh, yeah, you're gonna make me say it, Timna in the streets, <laughs> Kromming in the sheets. Uh, yeah, this is another blue farm list. No Consecrated Sphinx check on this one. We do have Talion in, in this version of uh, Timna Krom, no three mana Teferi, no Displacer Kitten, so that loop is out of this variant. We have the old snapback tech on this one, free bounce spell is a free bounce spell, so you can make it work for sure. 
We got our Underworld Breach, we have Dress Down, which is not always played in Blue Farm, but definitely a solid option for these decks. This one's definitely got some more engines. We have one Ring and we have Talion. Uh, I don't think I saw a Necropotence in this one, so back to that version of Blue Farm for sure. So no Necro, we got our classic Fire Covenant, a bunch of control pieces, Wheel and Windfall, which eh, the Wheel packages are definitely always debated in Blue Farm. People would debate whether they want Wheel, whether they want Windfall, whether they want all three. Definitely a topic that comes up a good amount. Most people will do the one wheel thing, but you never know with this dark type. We have Blue Farm taking down this tournament. So congrats to our Wombat friend and uh, congratulations for taking down the whole thing. Thanks again for the folks over Salt City for putting on another great tournament. I know the Utah scene is looking pretty cool as far as CDH is concerned. There's been a number of different decks that have come out of these tournaments and I've really enjoyed covering them each and every time. If you are curious about the Salt City group and any of the stuff that they are doing, there is actually a Discord that they sent me in the last video that I'm going to leave in the description down below this video, where if anyone's kind of local or within a reasonable distance from that area, y'all can check out that Discord and see when they're doing events because they do keep putting on these events and keep making them better and better. But yeah, I've had a ton of fun covering these tournaments and uh, I definitely will continue to do so. It's a good group out there at the Salt City. And once again, if you want to find out any information about them, it's in the description down this video. What'd y'all think of this top 16? There were definitely some cool lists in there. I loved personally seeing Bellaby again. And once again, many people thought the deck was dead after I stopped playing it. So I'm really happy that people have picked up that work and are testing new stuff and trying new cards. And Bellaby is just such an awesome card and I'm so glad that someone's playing it. The Armix Jessica list was one of the most unique lists I've seen in a long time playing CEDH. It's super, quirky and playing a bunch of different cool new cards. We have that crazy Unctus list, but we have a lot of really cool stuff in this top 16. Some stuff that definitely surprised me, some stuff that is really sweet. We also go down to 19, we have Rata Drabic of Urborg, which is another list I suggest folks come check out. I will leave the deck list for this breakdown in the description below as well. So come check out these decks, come check out these tournaments. It's super sick. Thank you all for watching this video and I will catch you next time. Turn out the lights in